Well, this morning we return to Romans chapter 8. Last week we were looking at verses 17 to 20, 29, and we just barely touched on verse, or 17 to 27, we barely touched on verse 28 last week. And so this morning, that one verse is going to be our focus. Um, certainly a, a verse that is familiar to us as Christians, we hear it, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Uh, that's a pretty monumental statement uh, in that, and, uh, and I'm not really exaggerating that. It, it is a huge statement in our faith. Um, we could probably spend uh, a few weeks uh, trying to get to understand totally what this verse means, but we'll, we'll limit it to just today. And... Uh, but the verse prepares a heart for a benediction that happens at the end of this chapter in, in, in verses 31 to 39 where, where Paul praises God and talks about his infinite love and some of the things that, that, that happen there. Uh, but you'll have to wait till after Easter before we get to that part. Uh, uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that. This morning we look at verse 28 and then next week verse 29 and 30 and then we'll, we'll hold that benediction until after um, after Easter. But uh, Paul began this chapter by saying, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it's this promise that our salvation is eternal. Uh, we've seen in this chapter that our salvation is secured by the ministry of the Holy Spirit and all the different things that the Spirit does in, in assuring us of that salvation. And this text is an incredible promise. We know that in all things... God works for the good. What an incredible. It, it isn't so just because God says so. It, it's so because um, he said so and the Holy Spirit makes it so in the work he does. So in this, this verse, there's only four elements of the promise of our security um, in our salvation as, as believers. There's the extent of it, the recipient of it, the source of it, and then the certainty of it. And so first is the extent of our security. Um, there's so many incredible promises that we've seen in this chapter, and yet it boils down to, to this one incredible promise and, and the extent of our security, the security that we can have in our faith in Jesus Christ and our salvation. So um, the beginning of the verse says, In all things God works for the good. And so that is the extent. It's in all things, right? Not in, in some things or in, in or whatever, but, but in all things God works together for good. So that ought to be a comforting statement to you, that even in the difficulties and the struggles and the problems and things happening, God is, is at work, <laughs> is at work, and, and he, he will bring all of that to, to good, um, um, there's nothing that, that I can imagine that could bring maybe more hope or joy or, or confidence or trust um, in going through difficult times and knowing that God is at work and he will eventually pull all of those things together for good. Uh, he's working all of those things together for good. And uh, so um, the extent of this is, is beyond our really our ability to grasp. It's comprehensive, all things. That's a lot. <laughs> the context uh, puts no limit on, on any of that. There, there's no limit at all. There's no confining factors. It doesn't say God works together um, in all sufferings or in all trouble or with, with good things or whatever the case. There's no limiting factor, all things. Uh, it's the same uh, word translated all things. It's translated in 2 Corinthians 4.15. It says, for all things are for your sake, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. It's that same all things. It's the same all things Paul uses in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 30, or 3, 21 and 22. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollo or Cephas or the word of life or death, all things present or things to come, all are yours. And he's talking about the blessing and the riches that God has in store for us. Um, then all things, everything. 
whatever the extent of our life situation, the difficulty, the pain, problems, intensity, uh, overwhelming trouble, whatever it is, God works all of that for good. The word translated works together in that or work for in some of your is the translations is the same word word that uh, Greek word that we get synergism or synergy from where things are working together. He's bringing those things together for a common goal or a, a purpose. That kind of a the synergy or synergism became kind of a big buzzword in the last decade or so when all these guys went about getting teams to work together in the workplace and whatever to work together. Well, God is working all things together in our lives um, for good, um, showing his faithfulness. And don't, don't misread uh, Romans 8.28. does not say that all things are good. We know better than that, right? <laughs> we know better than that. All things in themselves are not good. There are many things bad, but even those bad things, God works those things together for good. It doesn't matter what happens, God can work those things together for good. So, so what does that mean? For, for what good? What kind of, what kind of good um, is this? There's two different Greek words that be, can be translated good. And one is um, kaleos, which means good on the outside. It's nice to look at. Man, you painted your house, and that is a good-looking house. It looks good, right? From the outside, it, it looks good. And uh, they, they set down that, that dish before you. you. When you go to the restaurant, they bring out your food, and they set it down, and you haven't even got a bite taken yet, and the waitress comes by, and everything, everything okay? Well, it looks good, doesn't it? <laughs> It looks good, but I haven't tasted it yet. I don't know if he used a quarter cup of pepper and, you know, <laughs> curdled milk to make this or not. It looks good on the outside right now, but we haven't tasted it yet. So that's one word. Look at from the outside what it looks like. The other word that uh, is it's agathon, which, uh, we, um, which is morally or inherently good. We get uh, we, the name agatha from that. that it looks, it's good on the inside. It's good on the inside, and that's the word that Paul uses here. He's talking about God uses all those things to work together, to bring it together, and it's good. It maybe doesn't look good on the surface, but it on the inside, it, it's going to be good, okay? Uh, it's going to be good. Uh, all things work together for good. God causes that to happen. He works all things together for good. God doesn't say, oh, I wonder how this is going to turn out. He's at work in that, making it happen. It, it's good here and now, and it, and, and it will be good in our ultimate glory. It's good in both scenarios. In that Deuteronomy 8.16, God reminds people, the people of Israel, when uh, he says, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein the fiery serpents and scorpions and, dr scorpions and drought, and where there was no water, he brought... He brought you forth out of out of the rock of Flint. And then the verse goes on to say, Who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and he might test you? And, and then he finishes that phrase and he says, To you, the good, until the latter end. Yeah, he's telling this to people, and right, they, they've been wandering through the desert for 40 years, and been through all kinds of bad stuff, and he says, wait a minute. <laughs> but who was with you all the way through those things? And when you were screaming because there was no water, who made water come out of the rock? And we didn't have anything to eat, who made manna come from the sky for you every day? Who did those things for you? I did. So that in the end, you will be, have the best. He's worked them through that, and, he, and in that, they learn some discipline, and they learn some faith, and they learn some other things along the way in God, that all of it would work out for good, that they would be delivered then to a promised land. All right? All things will work together, and he told them that. God dragged Israel through 40 years of, of destitution and deprivation and, and difficulty, to refine them. 
Every, everything ultimately comes together for good for those who are children of God. That's it. 2 Corinthians 4.15, we read earlier, the passage continues on. It says, therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. If you are in a really, really tough spot in life, in a dark place in life, you will better understand the glory. Right? If we go through life and you, you, some people just never seem to have any trouble. <laughs> I don't know. They just, everything goes well. And it's talking about that they may not also then, if they you don't realize how bad it can get, maybe they don't realize how good it is when it's good. Yeah. In, even in our darkest times, when God is leading through that, none of that is going to compare to the glory, he says, that, that, is, that we will see one day. So let's talk about this all things word for a minute. First part, all things, it says good. Well, what, what's the good part? God, God, his attributes, his word, his, his, uh, his promises, uh, the opportunity to pray, all of those things are good, right? So God can use that. Angels are for are good. The Bible tells us they're ministering spirits to, to us. Uh, other Christians can be good for us. Those that come along beside us and help us and encourage us. So, so and uh, so there's just good things and that are working together. God is working together for our good. But He says in all things. So that means there's also some what some bad things, right? That are happening. Bad things that work for our good. Now again, this doesn't mean that bad things are good. It means that when we go through bad things, God's working them together for good. Now bad things aren't good, but they're used by God to work for our good. In that, that shows his absolute sovereignty over everything going on in our lives. It shows us his faithfulness um, when we go through those difficult things in our life. Nothing, nothing evil, nothing bad uh, can overcome God. He, can, he overrules those things and works those things together for good. Areas where bad things work for good, how about suffering? Ever suffered through a situation before? Yeah, we all have. Uh, it's, whether it's pain and death or sorrow, crying, uh, hurtful times, difficult medical situations, whatever the case is, we've been through times of suffering. And all, suffering and suffering in itself may not be evil, okay? It, it, uh, sometimes it is a result of an evil fallen world that, that causes those sufferings. But God can use those things. Some, because, you know, sometimes our suffering happens because we sin. <laughs> because we do bad things and we pay consequences and we go through difficult times. All right? Some suffering may be a way of, of God opening you up to Him. When, when I don't have any other hope, all of a sudden, now suddenly I'm ready to pray or say, God, what is happening here? Right? Sometimes suffering works in that way, it can, it, it can have good results. God can change our focus and our attention. Sometimes when we go through times of pain or suffering, James says, uh, count it all joy when you fall into what? Various trials. When you go through difficult times, count it joy. Peter says, after you've suffered a while, the Lord will make you perfect. Right? Right? How long is a while? I don't know. Is it a period of, of, of a couple of months? A couple of decades? A couple, you know what? I don't know. But in comparison to the glory of eternity, it's nothing. And in that time, God can draw us close and show his faithfulness. A second area where bad things work for our good is in struggling or and that struggling that our battle with sin. In, our, in temptation, 
It can work together for good because, again, it can bring us to times of prayer. It lets us see the difference between what is right and what is good. And uh, so there can, there can be that way. Um, what, if, if a hunter is out in the woods and he, and he fires a shot and he misses the animal, right? The animal scurries off in a hurry, right? And finds protection. Sometimes in our life, that's what happens with temptation. We, when, when that temptation comes, we scurry off and we find the safety in our God. And so it can be, it can work together. Um, temptation can be worked down for good and, um, and because it, it also maybe damages our spiritual pride. Oh, I'm, that doesn't, you know, I'll never fall for these temptations or whatever. And then temptation comes up and bites you and you go, oh my. <laughs> and it keeps us humble. Sometimes there's some things that can happen um, that work together uh, for good. Um, struggling pushes us to work with others sometimes, to help each other sometimes. There's blessings in that when we go through those difficult times and, and, and we uh, somebody comes alongside us and helps us through those times or we see someone else struggling and we go through and we help them in those times and there's blessings in that and it can be good. So that's the, the extent of the security. God works together in all things, good or bad. That God can work in all of those things, His purposes. He's working His purposes. And then the second thing is the recipient of, the secu of that security. There's a qualification. Who, who can claim this promise that God is working all things together for good? It doesn't say God works all things together for good for everybody all the time. God works all things together for good for who? Those who love him, is what the verse says, and those that have been called according to his purposes. There's two qualifications in that verse. Maybe you've not thought about those phrases before, but they're, they're like titles for, for Christians that, that those that know Jesus Christ by faith. Uh, we can be called the children of God. We can be called believers. We can be called saints or Christians. In this case, he says, he calls us all those who love him. Him, or all of those who have been called according to his purposes. That's who, these, that's who this promise is for. That's bad news for somebody that's not a Christian, that's going through difficult times and hard times. And, and you know, if, if you have no faith in, in Jesus Christ and you turn your back and you walk away from anything that has to do with God, I can't tell you that it's all going to work out for good. I don't know. Sometimes God uses those situations to get somebody's attention and bring them close to him. But I can tell you that if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that when you're going through those difficult times, God is at work bringing all those things together for good for those that love him and that are called according to his purposes. From way back in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy 7 and dozens of times in the Psalms and all through the Old Testament, we see believing people identified as those that love God. In the New Testament, there are many references, basically one in, basically in every book. Um, in the New Testament, describing Christians as those that love God. That's what he's talking about. True salvation produces those who truly love God. Remember you know, Ephesians 6.24 that says, Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. It's important for us to be reminded that loving God is a, is a basic element of that genuine redemption and our salvation. We're told over and over again in, in Scripture that those who love God Keep his commandments, right? She said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We see that over and over again. He talks about through the New Testament when he's teaching his disciples and he's telling them, well, how will they know? Well, well, I'll know because you do what I ask you to do. <laughs> That's how I know that you love me. He said, that if you keep my commandments. And so such love should be evident. 
in in the life of a believer that we we could should see that uh, trust in God and that that love that obedience that faithfulness that comes in the Christian and Paul says in verse twenty eight the promises so for those who love God and and maybe we don't love God as much as we should okay we we are a a sinful fallen race <laughs> and we struggle sometimes with that but the desire of a true believer is to love God to worship him to seek after him and and that even in times when we stumble and fall but our our ultimate desire is to lean toward him um, and so we, we see that it's a love that that uh, so we, we see that that's one aspect that's how we respond to him, those that love God. The second qualification is those who've been called according to his purpose. So the one is us reaching out to him, those that love God. And the other one is that have been called according to his purpose as he identifies us from his, from his side um, of the deal, the, who've been called according to his purpose. Matthew twenty-two fourteen. 14, the statement is made, many are called, but few are chosen. That statement Jesus makes at the end of the parable of the of the wedding feast. Remember that he says that the that there's going to be the big wedding and the and the the feast is prepared and and invitations have been sent out and no one comes. Remember that. And so it says that the master sends his servant out to find the poor and the needy and all the other ones and bring them in. There's two calls that we see in Scripture. One is a general call. There are a lot of people that hear a gospel message in their life. They hear the, they hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ. But they don't respond to it, right? They get the invitation, but they don't come. And, and in this case, he's, he's talking about this parable that the Israel, the people of Israel, the teachers of Israel, all of those that God has blessed for all the years that that invitation was sent to them, that Messiah is coming and coming to the wedding. <laughs> and they rejected him, right? And he reached out to the Gentiles and all of those that were others. And so that is the second call. Many are called, the invitation went to everybody, but few are chosen. He brings them in. And we see that. That's uh, uh, the scripture about the finding the narrow way, right? Broad is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. It, it's in that same, same realm of things. God identifies us here. Who is this promise for? Those that have been called according to his purpose. Those that have been brought into the family of God. Those are the ones that I'm promising this for, that I'm working all things together for good, for those that love him, that he's called, that have responded to the invitation, those that came <laughs> to the wedding. That's who this promise is for. Those that he predestined and calls, those he also called, Verse, as we'll see um, next week into verse 30. He, he called them. And then he justifies them and he glorifies them. That's the promise we have, that he's called us into the family of God. He justified us because when, in the blood of Jesus Christ, he looks at us and it's just as if we never sinned, right? And then he glorifies us. And that means we spend an eternity with him in heaven. That's who the promise is for. Verse 20, Romans 8, 28 is not a good verse to take to somebody that doesn't know Christ. It's going through a hard time. And say all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose because they don't want anything to do with God. Right? I suggest you start with a different verse <laughs> when you go and talk to them. The best way to start with somebody in that situation is something about, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you go through this. This kind of thing all by yourself. I can tell you how I get through these kind of situations that have happened in my life. Is I know that my God is with me and he, he wraps his arms around me and he carries me through those difficult times, right? I would suggest you start there with him and, and, uh, and share with him John chapter 3. Don't start with Romans 8.28. 
If you know a brother or sister in Christ that's going through a difficult time, take Romans 8.28 to them and say, hey, listen, God hadn't forgotten you. God's not ignoring you. He's working together in all things for good, for those that love him, called according to his purpose. And you go on and read verses 29 and 30 to them, and you tell them because he's called us for a purpose and he's justified us, and we're going to glor be glorified with him in heaven. Don't lose heart, all right? That's the difference in the application. This verse is for believers. This promise is for believers to know that. That is who it is for. What's the third thing? The source of the security. The promise. This one's pretty straightforward. Who's working all things together for good? God. It tells us that. All right. That's the source. God is the one. And he says at the end of the verse, call to his purposes. Again, God. What's the source of this promise? God is the one that promises this. God is the one that promises that in those difficult times and struggles and all, he's working all things together for good, for those that love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We can't save ourselves. We can't keep ourselves saved. But God can and God does. He's called us according to his purpose. All right? That's, that is the great thing in this. Nothing can stand in the way of that. Uh, the difficult times, the hard times, the bad things in life, can't, none of that can, can keep God from working things together for good for those that love Him, moving us toward His purpose for us and glory. And then the fourth is the certainty of the promise, the certainty of our security in this. And so if you notice, we started, we skipped the first three words of the verse when we started breaking this down. Because the answer is back there at the beginning of the verse. And we know. <laughs> and we know that in all things, God works for the good. For those who love him, we've been called according to his purpose. How do we know that? I just told you. In all of the other parts, that's how we know. That's why, that's why I kept those three words to the end. <laughs> because the, the answer is in the verse. We know because of the scripture. Divine revelation tells us that all things are working together for our ultimate good. The scripture says that it is so. Over and over, the scripture tells us. That's why Paul launches into this praise at the end of this chapter. That, that all things are working together for good. For those that love God, they're called according to his purpose. That, that we have wonderful, incredible things to look forward to in the future. But we also have an assurance that in the difficult times that we go through in this life right now, that God is at work taking care of us, caring for us. If you're struggling with any with the illustration, let me with this concept, let me give you a, an illustration. The absolute supreme illustration that God works all things together for good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. He sent his son. And his son went through a lot of bad things. He was despised, rejected, everything. He was perfect and righteous and holy, and we killed him. That's bad. That's the bad. That's the evil that is going on. That's the bad situation that's going on. But you know what? If that didn't happen, there's no hope for us in our future. Even in that horrible things, the most heinous things that happened in the history of mankind, that we killed the Son of God, he worked that together for good for those that loved him that are called according to his purpose. Because without Jesus' death on the cross and a resurrection, there's no heaven for you and me. God works all things together for good for those that love him that are called according to his purpose. And we can know that because over and over again, God proves it in Scripture. And he proved it mostly at Calvary. 
Father God, what an incredible thing, what an incredible promise that we have that in our difficult times and our struggles that, that, that we get disillusioned with what is happening here and what is going on, that we can be reminded by this verse that all things, that you are working all things together for good. For those that love you, for those who have been called according to your purpose, you're working those things all together for good. Father, in this, in our humanness, it's hard for us to see that sometimes. And, it's, and, and we don't understand how and why certain things are happening in our lives or the lives of our, our brothers and sisters in Christ sometimes. Why would, why would we go through this or how does it happen? And Father, instead of asking the whys, Father, teach us to thank you that you are with us and walking us through those difficult times, that you are, are carrying us through those things, working them together for good. Maybe it's, a, it, maybe it's from a perspective that we can't grasp in our humanness. But help us to trust you. And by faith, believe your promises to us. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.